Mr. David Diggs, a uh, fellow car guy, fellow NSX owner, but even cooler than that, he's a musician, a well-published musician who's been doing this for a long time, not to make you feel old or not, but longer than I've been born. So, uh, David, welcome to Ouch. Hard Parking, man. Well, thank you. I'm excited to be here. Yeah. Excited to have you. So, I was poking around a little bit uh, on your profile and just kind of listening to some of the tunes and I'm like, you know what? This is this is pretty and I, and I know and you're, we're going to get into a billboard um top billboards, but uh I mean that's pretty good stuff, man. Yeah, well, you do it long enough and some things happen for sure. Yeah, looking back, I can see some of that. At the time, you always wonder, you know, when is this going to happen, my big break or whatever. But uh, yeah, it's been fun for a long time. So let's, let's, because I don't know much about you and my listeners probably don't as well, but I have to, I'd be remiss if I didn't honestly say that by the time they do look you up, you will have some new listeners. So let's kind of go back and talk about your humble beginnings a little bit and to the point of, you know, when's this going to take off? When's this going to stick? You know, at, at what point was that in your life? Well, yeah, I kind of grew up behind what we called the Orange Curtain, which was Orange County, California. Actually, I was all over the place. But uh, at, at the point that I was really deciding to do music seriously, you you were just, you had to be in Los Angeles, of course, or, you know, New York or Chicago or somewhere. Uh, it was a different world than it is now. You couldn't do anything online, so you had to kind of be there with a phone number with the right area code and stuff like that. So um, I moved to L.A. in 74, I think. Now that tells you how old I am. But um, started working there, and, and you know, just you kind of have to hang around and be every place you can, and you get one referral and then another one. and I played, you know, keyboards and studio work and things like that. And then eventually you might get a song on a project that you wrote, meaning me. <laughs> and then you can maybe arrange and, you know, write some horns or some strings, orchestration, which I did a lot of that. Uh, I also had an 18-piece big band, did two big band albums, which very few people are into big bands, but it was a good uh, proving ground for me, you know, writing new songs all the time and arranging them. Now, well, hold on. Well, so what does that mean? Well, I mean, just in terms of experience, uh, you know, the traditional big band like Duke Ellington or Buddy Rich or uh, Stan Kenton, that kind of a thing where it's, you know, four trumpets, four trombones, five saxophones, and a wow. rhythm section. A big band. So, Yeah. <laughs> So I actually formed a band. It, it actually started in, in the Musicians Union in Santa Ana, California. And we would meet weekly, and it would be a great place for me to try out new charts, also in the college bands, new arrangements. We call them charts. And found great players that way and uh, just, yeah, developed skills in terms of orchestrating, which came in handy much later. Right. On more pop oriented records and things so and i was always doing my own project um i would end up usually writing about an an album which is what we called it <laughs> an album's worth of material every year or so and uh I, I got that a bit of a break with the first two big band albums and then i switched over to what was called quiet storm which was sort of r&b oriented yeah and then it called, was called The Wave, 94-7, The Wave. That was all across the country. And then now they've changed it to the term Yacht Rock, which I just absolutely can't stand. But Yacht that is kind Rock. Of, <laughs> yeah. That was kind of the niche. So, But again, more R&B oriented, R&B fusion jazz when I was doing it than, than what some of that is now on the boat, as they say. When was this um, this Quiet Storm era? Because I remember being a kid in middle or high school, and at a certain time of night, maybe they just stole the phrase, maybe it has nothing to do with it, but at a certain time of night, your favorite radio station would switch over to the Quiet Storm, and then just the whole tempo of everything would change. Absolutely, yeah. No, that's it. Uh, 
more often at night. Uh, I'm trying to remember, I think KJLH, I think was one station in the LA area. Uh, and yeah, a lot of those, those stations developed across the country. And it was, again, R&B oriented. They started yep. to have vocals and uh, West Coast sound is what they also called it. And that was people like Al Jarreau and Steely Dan, of course. Um, you know, those kinds of groups. Larry Carlton. Um, just jazz oriented pop music, really. So if it's West Coast, is that is that called uh, gangster jazz? <laughs> Could be, <laughs> maybe on the quiet store of stations, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> no, smooth jazz, I'm afraid, but I always try to rise above that a little bit too and um, get a little bit more complex in the, you know, the voicings and the writing and the arrangements and all that. So, but yeah, that's kind of what I was doing. Um, so I ended up, I don't know, I guess I have about 15 albums. I don't really count. One five? Yeah of my own and then i was you know i was working on other albums all the time for people and i keep saying albums maybe eight tracks or cassettes or vinyl or those cds that were so hot and up and coming and now are long gone but um so i yeah i had product out pretty consistently until the mid 80s when the top 10 album that you just mentioned that uh, was on the billboard charts and cash box magazine congratulations a, half a year thank you yeah, it's on my wall, and my wife appreciates it. <laughs> so, so as you so going from the seventies to the to the mid to late eighties, you know, with the jazz and the and the sounds changing with the Quiet Storm and some of the kind of the R and B style uh, flows, you know, how is it? Did you were you able to just kind of sit back and watch it just slowly changing over time, or did it kind of? for the most part, stay the same with some added new, new flavor. And then, you know, compare that to now, cause those are some of the sounds, some of the music I remember from being a kid, whether I was watching a TV show, you know, like mm -hmm. Miami vice or something where the music controls the tempo way more than people ever actually realize to, yeah. to now you don't really even, even movies, unless it's a, a big score, they don't seem mm -hmm. to feature any of those, those emotional scene to scene transitional sounds. Yeah, I think you're right. Um, yeah. Jan Hammer. I did, I think did the music from Miami Vice. Yeah. It's very electric or whatever. Um, you know, there's, there's always change. That's the thing that's, that's great. And it's also frustrating. Um, things just keep evolving. And again, they, they might get a little simpler and softer and they'll have one label attached to them. And then, you know, some couple people will have a hit at more in the R&B field, as we discussed. And right. it'll have just a little bit more of a funk kind of feel to it. Um, and, of course, I was pretty heavily involved with arranging, you know, music orchestration with, for humans that all arrived at the studio at the same time. And we created something live, which was very fun. You know, just the human aspect like a car meet or whatever else, you wouldn't want to be there alone with a computer all the time. Um, so then all of a sudden synthesizers came along and all that stuff went away. People kind of stopped recording those things in LA and they went to maybe Eastern Europe to record or maybe Canada because it was cheaper and, or they just played it with one finger on a synthesizer. And we're talking what, mid eighties? Yeah, probably. Let's see. What has it been? Yeah, maybe early 80s. Um, yeah, I started, you know, the Moog synthesizer, and then Roland came on strong from Japan, and uh, Korg, and, you know, all the different companies. Uh, so luckily, I embraced that after being scared to death, watching the calls go away. Mm. And I uh, just kind of included that as part of what I do, and hopefully... You know, the orchestration and the arranging aspect helped me to be a little different than some that just put their right hand down and started playing whatever they heard. <laughs> right. Yeah. So that, that so. was that the, the, the call slow down, excuse me. So is that kind of one of those big signs like, Oh, uh, the significance is going away. Maybe I'm not evolving with the music enough. You know, what am I going to do next? Are those some of the things that kind of 
crept in? Like, what was that like? Yeah, definitely that. Um, and of course, it was even wor- worse for some of the players. I mean, how would you like to be a trombone player who was doing Earth, Wind, and Fire dates and, you know, film scores all the time? And then all of a sudden, there's just none of that because you can, again, push it on a synthesizer and make right. that sound. But um, so, yeah, I mean, I all everybody was running scared. It wasn't unlike COVID in some ways because all of a sudden, you know, things just changed instantly. And, Everybody kind of evolved and had to make adjustments and Zoom came in and it's kind of the same thing. Uh, but if if I hadn't really embraced synthesizers, I think I, I would have had to go to work and ask if they want fries with that burger or something. Right. <laughs> so were you always able to, like once you started landing your albums and finding, like were you always busy enough to where you didn't have to have a regular day job, you didn't have to sell aluminum siding? you know, Monday through Friday from, <laughs> from eight to three and then work in the studio from three thirty to 12. Yeah, pretty much. Um, I did fall into something quite a bit later that I did by choice, which was a, I worked at a biotech company, but I kept doing the music mm-hmm. all along, but it was actually the number one independent biotech company in the world, but it was with technology. I was in the IT department. And at the time they actually used Macintosh computers, which hmm. I used in music. Hmm. So that was actually a whole lot of fun. And I understood then what, you know, benefits or insurance or when people said, have a good weekend, I said, oh, that's right. I'm off, you know, because right. usually I would just be working the weekend. But it's feast or famine. You know, I can't say I was always, always thrilled with the flow, you know, the evenness of it. Cause, and I did, you know, touring with some major groups and I would do that for a while and then that would end or go away and then something else would come up. and. You wait by the phone and hopefully it happens. And, but yeah, I always, I always made it work with just pretty much that. And those are kind of some of the beyond the glory things, you know, have you, have you done a lot of collaborations, you know, who have you toured with any super big names that are just unmistakable unless you were born yesterday? (laughs) Well, again, my unmistakables, it's sometimes a little harder, but uh, yeah, I spent fair. Well, four decades with uh, Pat Boone. I think we talked about that on the phone the other day, but yeah. uh, he was a peer to Elvis Presley and actually Elvis even opened the show for Pat. So that shows wow. you how big Pat was, even though not too many people know him as much, but um, I did that. And then at the time they had a family show with his four daughters, one of whom was Debbie Boone. And while we were just starting out on the road, there was this song called you light up my life. And uh, with the movie of the same name, Mike Kerb was involved with that and started going up the charts and shockingly went all the way to number one and stayed there longer than almost any record. Maybe that's before Taylor Swift or something, but <laughs> it was a smash huge hit worldwide. So those that made her a star, we started doing The Tonight Show. Pat would guest host even sometimes. For, it was for Johnny Carson back then, or maybe Leno and... Uh, the Midnight Special with Wolfman Jack, uh, the the uh, Pat Boone Family Specials, Christmas, Easter, all that stuff. Because in his heyday, he had a weekly television show called The Chevy Show, obviously sponsored by Chevrolet, hmm. with massive stars. I mean, Ella Fitzgerald, Count Basie, Nat King Cole, you know, just everybody. He would be doing duets with them. He was a big star, a really big star. And he just turned 90 and he's still out there doing things. So got to hand it to him. But uh, then I also toured with a couple other big groups, Richie Fure, who was in the gold or platinum selling group called Buffalo Springfield, which spawned, it was uh, Jim Messina, which became Loggins and Messina later. And then it was with Stephen Stills and Neil Young, who became Crosby, Stills, Nash, and Young. Uh, When Richie left at that time, he formed Poco, which was a huge group. And then a group called the Southern Hillman Fure Band. And then he became a solo artist. And at that point, he was actually, the Buffalo Springfield was like my favorite group in junior high school. Okay. So touring and writing songs with him. And I was able to work on four albums. And I would just look from the stage there over at Richie and realize, gosh, this is that guy who was just eating up in junior high school and here right. I am on the road. So dream come true. 
yeah yeah so some of that stuff and got a taste of it all i guess but i always kind of wanted to be in the studio and sort of be home you know at normal hours i i wasn't a big drug addict or anything else so i just like to have a normal life and enjoy the music part which luckily i was able to do for the most part so were you a little drug addict <laughs> no no not at all really <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I tried pot and when I was listening to Buffalo Springfield in junior high school a few times, but no. Pot, you're showing your age, David. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Blow, what is it? <laughs> yeah, pot, pot was the thing as well for me growing up. It was like, dude, you smoke pot? You know. <laughs> yeah, it's it's, yeah. it's funny. <laughs> Cannabis, I don't know. <laughs> right, CBD. yeah. Um, what is, I mean, do you have a, a favorite tour story or a night story some crazy thing that had happened when you guys are playing whether it's just somewhere local or somewhere on the road that you can share oh, with us yeah <laughs> actually there are a few of them but you know pat was a multi is a multi-millionaire and they're you know they're different he he gets stopped speeding in his cobra or one of his others his rolls royce or something and they just want his autograph they don't sure. they're not worried about it they know who he is most of them or they did at least <laughs> But once I was, I was actually playing guitar initially on the road with him. Um, I've always played a little of each. And I had my road cases, long guitar case, and then the amp was in a road case. And we were waiting in an airport somewhere, and all these things were coming out. It did not come. So I was standing there. Actually, Pat was there, too, at the time. And I said, I'm, I'm waiting for my guitar. I don't know. I think you know, it kind of turned off for a minute. I think it might be stuck or something. So Pat Boone, the number one hit selling tv star movie star just gets up on that whatever the turn it whatever they right, call it yeah. about, and he climbs up into the inner bowels of the airport and he's gone for six seven minutes they call the cops and sure enough my amp and guitar come floating down and once again the cops arrived the airport cops i guess and just wanted his autograph and said now you know you really can't do that you can't climb up into the mechanism there that's <laughs> funny he did get, yeah he did get my guitar um and there you know there's a lot of them like that um i actually it wasn't when we were on the road but he told us about it he got a bad review once and they sent a little surprise on the plane to the reviewer in an air sick bag. And I, I won't, I can let you guess what might've been in it. <laughs> I, I can, I'll use my imagination. <laughs> but yeah, he was quite a nut. He was, he was a lot of fun and he still is, you know, he's uh, he's a pretty amazing guy. And he's, he's 14 years old in his mind. So he's got more energy than I do. But so what is David Diggs doing today? You know, we've kind of talked through some of the, the, the heydays of the 70s and the mid to late 80s. Your discography goes pretty far. Um, and do you have something? Like, what are you doing now? Do you have another record? Are you still kind of playing around? Because I thought I saw maybe you have something on your website, daviddiggs.com. Yeah. Well, the last one uh, is, well, first of all, my daughter, Rachel Diggs, um, that's her music name, at least. Um, had a big song on the ABC Family Show. Maybe I told you. I don't know. But no. The Little Liars. Oh, wow. It was wow. a massive uh, kids show or whatever. Oh, yeah. My daughter watched it. Yeah. Yeah. And she had a big song on that, on the pilot, actually. It ran twice in a row for an hour. And then it was in the show later, too. It was, I mean, she was being tweeted about literally all over the world. Um, and so she started singing in my group as well, my jazz oriented group. And so eventually we were able to do a CD called black coffee, which is the American songbook stuff that was actually on Pat Boone's label. And uh, I was able to, which is very rare. I was able to call the most famous expensive players on earth and there's no substitute, you know, it's just, I mean, guys I loved working with and or had admired my whole life. So that album has been out for a while. It's available everywhere. Um, and that's the last artist project I guess I've done. Um, although 
I just a week or two or three ago had three of my albums from the 80s and 90s come out on a Japanese label called P Vine. Hmm. So those are being re released with cool covers with the kanji characters down the right, you know, the little label ribbon thing they do. And it, so that stuff's fun, but I'm still working. I'll get a call. Uh, I, you know, I can do a lot of it over the internet now, mm-hmm. like everything else. Um, I did a thing not long ago for Roger Williams. He was a massive star piano player. He had a couple, I mean, a lot of number one hits. One of them was Born Free from the movie. Um, and Autumn Leaves was another, his version. And he had written a song um, for his daughter. And she actually wrote lyrics to that song and had heard my Black Coffee album with Rachel, my daughter. Mm-hmm. And she thought it would be great to have some original clips from him and then have Rachel sing this new song, which I arranged. So, you know, I did that with her a couple of years ago. And uh, Rachel did a duet with Pat Boone a couple of years ago, the, the big Inya song, uh, Only Time, it's called. I believe that sold 80 million albums back then. Yeah, I spent some time in front of my computer monitor watching the mm-hmm. old uh, Windows or w- Windows Media Player or Winamp or whatever, do its little graphics. I may, I may or may not have been in a normal state of mind, but uh, I think everybody knows that famous Enya song. Yeah. Well, if you get a massage anywhere, you know it, right? right. <laughs> so, you know, I do stuff like that. Um, I do have one new, completely new song that came out on, on like a bonus track on one of these three in Japan. And, and we play live. Uh, I spent most of my life in LA and then we just moved to Idaho three years ago, partly to be near the daughter I just was talking about who has five grandkids of ours. And then they promptly moved eight hours North, which is what they do. You know, they do different things. (laughs) Right. (laughs) um, Where in Idaho are you? uh, We're in Eagle, which is basically Boise. I know exactly where Eagle is. Yeah. Yeah. I I stayed at the uh, Hilton garden Inn there. Um, right oh, next to Bardenay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and actually, well, you know, you... Wes Tankersley, which you you know from uh, online, a uh, dear friend yes. of mine, co-host on One Drink Wednesday, he, he's out there too. And I think Caldwell or Boise or something, but spends a lot of time oh. in Eagle. Yeah. Nice, yeah. Well, then you know, yeah. But uh, yeah, so we got out of town. And again, we could only do it because of the way things are now. Um, so we've played quite a few times here. We did the Eagle Jazz Festival a couple of years in a row. And there's a lot of restaurants and little clubs that have music almost every night of the week here, which is sort of interesting. You know, it's a lot more to do in some ways than Los Angeles. Right. So. A lot easier to get to things. Yeah, that too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And you, so... Who are you a big fan of these days other than what you've talked about? Is there somebody out there that you kind of, you know, binge their music every once in a while, or if they have something you check into it, even if they've been around for as long as you or half as long as you. Yeah. Um, you know, I, it's just, it's almost hard to answer, but I like all the usual suspects, you know, people like Herbie Hancock or Miles Davis product at least. Uh, the Brecker brothers, Michael Brecker is one of my absolute favorites. Um, oh, Pat Metheny, uh, Yellow Jackets. There's just a lot of them. And of course, I mean, I listen to the radio, such whatever you want to call it, XM radio, I guess now, not terrestrial. <laughs> right. Um, and I like a lot of things and I try to stay in touch, but I'm really, I really love jazz and, you know, with a tinge of classical or whatever else, R and B, you know, Earth, Wind, and Fire, all these groups. Um, good, uh, yeah, just everybody, really. Good, solid uh, yacht music, <laughs> right? <laughs> well, Steely Dan, but not so many others. Where do you think that label comes from? That genre of yacht music? Because when you say that, I just imagine a forty-five to sixty-foot yacht. People kind of having a a wine and cheese spread. And just kind of listening to music that's not too heavy. Yeah, I think it came about for various reasons. Um, The California or the West Coast sound contributed, but 
a lot of these artists um, do those cruises. Dave Cause um, and Jonathan Butler, who was a big star out of South Africa. I did actually, I did work on four albums with him. An amazing guy. He's a lot, he was initially styled a lot after Stevie Wonder. Mm. Good guitar player, uh, just great writer, all that stuff. But so he's on all those, you know, cruises, literally Catalina Island cruise. And so I think that contributed. And then there were a few conspicuous hits, like I hate to even say it, but like Brandy, you remember that song at all? Brandy, you're a fine girl. What a good wife. Anyway, I should, you know, no, 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 no. Keep singing. It might come to me. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it's it's clearly yacht rock sound, mm -hmm. and then they in, they brought in like Toto and Boss Gags, and you know a lot of. I'm lot very, of I'm games. actually very familiar with that. Yeah, yes. I, I think like every kid, I had the Toto album. Yeah, yeah, and a lot of that cassette. Jazz, Sorry, too. cassette. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, I have some of those if you ever need them. <laughs> My own product here. <laughs> no, that's I'm I'm definitely gonna. To, to get some of your stuff or, you know, maybe more of your stuff because you're available all over the place. We'll talk about in a few minutes. Um, want to talk about cars at all? Yeah. Yeah. Let's switch, let's switch to cars here. Um, the whole, your, your story is awesome and I'm glad that we were able to connect and I can't wait to see you here in a few months at NS Expo. Um, Likewise. yeah, it'll be a great time. Uh, yeah. So Let's talk about EVs a little bit because that's what everyone's into right now. Um, mm -hmm. The the 2020, 2035 mandate, uh, whether that's going to happen or not, very doubtful. But you know, EVs right. and uh, hybrids. You know, what have what have you had, and what is your overall opinion? I guess, and there's a lot to probably unpack there. So you know, what what do you have, or what have you had? Yeah, um, well, I've had actually at least five that I can remember, remember uh, either hybrid or plug-in hybrid or full electric uh, over the last probably 15 years or whatever it's been. I think the first one I had was a Civic Hybrid, which was a good little car. Um, and then That's a little I, thing, right? Not that little... But it's a Honda Civic. Yeah, so, but... Yeah, okay. it's a four-seater or something, yeah. And that was a pretty good car. It was my introduction to hybrid. And uh, I had a Prius at one point. I was rear-ended rear -ended by a Ford F-150 who was texting. Of so of course that eliminated yep. that. Yeah. <laughs> but that was a good car, too. I'd probably still have it, if not. Uh, and then I had the um, uh, Ford C-Max, which I could put my equipment in the back of kind of a little SUV-ish uh, plug-in hybrid. A lot of the time I could make it just on the electric part after plugging it in. Never heard of that thing. Range of, yeah, like 30 mile range or something. And then I guess um, I might be forgetting one at the moment, but then I, then I had the all electric uh, Chevy Spark, which was a Korean, uh, joint venture i guess and that became the bolt i think later. it's tiny oh, isn't it I, it is it's really tiny yeah uh, and the, the volt is also one i had later so it's at least five and right. of course the nsx that i have now is a hybrid technically but the the spark was actually kind of cool i just i leased it i remember it was 199 a month nothing down i drove it back and forth to pat boone's office from agora hills which is a good two, three hours round trip a lot of the time. I charged a little bit at home and I would charge there with the 220 volt chargers for free. And I literally drove almost free for three years. Then mm. I turned it in. So that one was a pretty good experience. I um, didn't, I didn't hear Tesla come out of your mouth. Is there any reason why other than they have just a crazy price tag? <laughs> yeah, kind of more the, the crazy price tag. And Honestly, to this day, I don't think I've even ridden in one. I've heard all about the plaid and everything, and I, I should have, but it uh, hasn't worked out. Um, yeah, I guess I wasn't that much of a fan, just kind of the way they looked. And, you know, they were a startup at the time that I was noticing them. So uh, just didn't, yeah. What do you think then of, okay, so we'll, we'll go to the other part of that this electrification movement, do you think it's the right direction? You know, what are yours? What does David Diggs think about the electrification movement right now? 
Well, I was really all in for a long time. I almost even about the time that I got the current NSX, which was my third, um, I was almost putting money down for the Cayman Electric, which will be 2025 and onward unless things change. But, you know, there's all these discussions, and I think they're true about the grid, obviously, duh, <laughs> it needs right. electricity. And then where the, the materials are sourced in terms of, you know, labor in other countries and mining and just all those issues. So I, I'm not seeing, I, you know, we talk about it a lot. I meet several guys every morning at Starbucks here in Eagle, and we talk about it all the time. And some of them are a bit older than I, so they're just, they want ice, you know, they want an sure. internal combustion engine. I'm kind of in the middle. Um, you know, the NSX, as you know, is is such an amazing combination of both technologies. And I guess the new Corvette is finally catching up <laughs> to that idea. That E-Ray is supposedly uh, amazing, so. I'm sure. But it yeah. should be, right? It's taken, yeah. the, it's taken our technology in the NSX that was arguably already a generation old by the time we got it in 17. And it's, <laughs> and it's built on top of that. So by every, every measurable possible, it should be a better vehicle. Well, I'm glad you said that because I didn't have to. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's all right. I'm allowed to. That's, that's, it's true though. You know, that's what they say. But you say this yeah. is your, let's back up a second. This is your third NSX. Are they all the NC1 2017 plus platform or did you have like an early NA1, NA2? Uh, I had two of the early ones in the 90s. Um, 92 and then 94 which I wrote about in this little article for the NSX Club magazine, which perhaps will come out. I don't know. It'll come um, out. It'll come uh, yeah. out. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't know what the schedule was or anything, but, but yeah, it's, um, you know, I, I bought lots of cars and sold and got a new idea. I was pretty much the crazy car guy. Um, and usually at the time those were expensive too. And right. I got rid of the second one and, kind of a funny story which again is in that article if it comes out but um i i sold the 94 which was a wonderful brooklyn's green with tan interior which i loved and still do actually because i hit something on the freeway going to hear my daughter sing and it wasn't a person or anything or an animal <laughs> but just the whole front end kind of came down and i just thought you know what this is just too expensive and then costs and of course in california the insurance everything so like a fool i got rid of it and then i missed it so much and i was walking along uh the car lot dealerships there in westlake village near agora where i lived and i looked up and there was my car oh, wow so when i went in to rebuy it and that was an interesting discussion with my wife of course <laughs> remember that green car we just had three months ago and I went in to buy it. They wanted proof of insurance. And I handed her my old, which was still current, my proof of insurance on that exact green NSX. So she looked at me, looked down at the number, looked up again, looked down. She just couldn't figure out what's going, what was going on. I said, yeah, that's the car. I'm buying it again. So hmm. anyway, crazy stories. But um and then I actually had an S2000, Honda S2000 after that, which was kind of a cousin, I felt, to those cars. So, right, yeah. 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 You know that 94, a lot of people don't realize this, especially people listening to this, although there's going to probably be a few NSX owners that will consume this podcast. But that's a rare car, a 94 coupe. That's a rare car. Mm-hmm. And yeah. especially that color, of course. Yeah. Yeah, it's not the first color a lot of people picked also on the NC one either, but I've always loved that combination. So, yeah, that's that was my regret. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't white, black, or silver. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, that made it even more desirable for a lot of people. And what the mid 90s is when a lot of car manufacturers started experimenting with their colors. So then everybody came out with some sort of a, a green. Right, or some sort of uh -huh. a purple, or, or I guess Ford had like that weird fusion. I don't know what the color is, but everybody listening probably knows what I'm talking about. So it's oh, just yeah. kind of a weird time. Yeah. Would yeah. you, um, so, so with the, the current NSX that you have now, I think we were discussing the other day, it's a 2020? Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
You loving it? I am. Um, yeah, absolutely. You know, it's, it's, it's not even, it's not finicky. It's just so great. And there's so much going on. It makes me a little nervous. You know, for example, this recall that I'm trying to get in on here, you know, things like that make me a little nervous once in a while, but it just, to me, it's so elegant. And there's an element that's just so Honda about it, which to me Mm -hmm. is a compliment. You know, that's, that's really what I wanted to come back to. And yeah, it's, it's a highlight of my life for sure these days. All right. So we can, we can reverse this back because I kind of took a sidebar and went went down the NSX road. So as far as uh, the EV versus the hybrid technology, um, where do you, because I support EVs as well, but I'm unsure of really what the future holds with them, Mm -hmm. regardless of how they're sourced and stuff. Uh, Yeah. I think a lot of people look at that and say it's it's just like Blood Diamond, right? Blood Diamond came out, and I don't think that really stopped anyone from buying diamonds. It was mm-hmm. just um, yeah. it was just kind of the end thing to kind of oppose it. Even though personally, yeah, it, it sucks, but I'm still probably going to buy a diamond, right? And I'm probably going to yeah. buy an EV, you know, regardless of how the the technology, or the materials are sourced. Um, mm-hmm. But with that being said, in the grid problems. Do you think we can actually hit that or do you think we should probably take a look at just improving our hybrid technology? Well, I've said quite a bit that, you know, it just, it seems like the hybrid technology is kind of the best of everything. Although you're still going to have to have gas stations for Mm -hmm. the most part, and you're still going to have to have the electronic aspect. Um, But, you know, the instant improvement in mileage, no matter which mode you're in, um, I guess you're going to still have some of the repairs you wouldn't have if it was a pure electric, um, you know, no oil changes was fun for three years in that spark. Um, and just, you know, fewer moving parts, of course, nothing anybody can really repair on their own anymore because everything's gotten so complex in a good way for the most part. But, and then I have to say, I, I went to a couple of Porsche events where they invited us to drive the Taycan, the electric car. Mm -hmm. And there's something about it that just really does remind me, not the Porsche in, you know, specifically, but just a little bit like a driving a, you know, a vacuum cleaner or something. It's just, it's so fast and so easy to, uh, to make that happen. But there's an element that, that I'm missing, I think now more than ever. Um, so yeah, I just there's a lot of questions, and obviously it'll have to do with I'm sure the the election coming up and who wins or how that all goes too. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've always been suspect. I think it was even 2030 for a while, and you know now whatever 2035. Right? I've seen some pushback as you have, you know, from various companies. I guess Europe's all in it seems, but I think it remains to be seen. I don't know. Right. I could tell you, having driven that Porsche and had uh, driven one of the Teslas in a Model 3, which people mm-hmm. could easily tell me that's hardly a Tesla, but, <laughs> you know, having driven both of those, the Porsche feels not only more refined, but feels like a normal car um, yeah. in a good way. So, yeah, yeah, if you've never been in or driven a Tesla, you'd only set yourself up for disappointment having driven that Porsche. <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. You kind of brought up talking about the election a little bit, and I think one of the biggest yeah. things, and I'm going to start doing this, I started with another episode and just kind of asking up until that point, because there's a lot of transportation-related questions that most mm-hmm. people never know about when you're deciding what you're, what's important to you in your local state and, and even on the federal level, because they don't really mm-hmm. talk about that uh, on TV. All you hear really is, um, should EVs... Are we going to hit that EV target in 2035? Because that's the one big thing, which, by the way, is a question that's not even on this part of the quiz on iSideWith.com political quiz. Oh, really? Yeah, it's not even on here. Uh, but there are a couple of them. So I figured if we can like pick and choose maybe maybe two or three. Uh, one of the mm-hmm. ones that I had asked recently, and I'm going to ask you what your opinion on this. And I will tell you, it's not going to affect you in Eagle, Idaho. I can promise you this question wouldn't affect <laughs> you there. Uh, but uh-huh. it would have affected you 100% in California and as well as maybe the main road in Boise, which, again, I'm not quite sure it would be that effective in that uh, area. 
the last time I was yeah. there. But the question is, should cities implement congestion pricing to reduce traffic in busy urban areas? And to me, this sounds like a toll lane or a toll road. Yeah. Um, if it's kind of what they either are doing or we're talking about doing in New York and other areas, I don't like that idea so much, but if it's, if it's a toll road, like it, you know, like in Orange County, California, where you can choose to get on it if you want to, I think that's great. Um, I'm not sure I like to be forced to do anything. Um, and yeah, it's probably worth paying for. I guess I would say that my couple of GPSs are set to avoid toll mm -hmm. roads. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it, you know, growth brings congestion and traffic. So uh, I would say whatever needs to be done. But as long as, you know, it's nice if there's an option, some freedom. And um, not that, and I think if you can give, if you decide to give, so to speak, to that effort. That's great. Just being forced is, I'm not as crazy about that idea. So, you know, you brought up a pretty good point. And because I don't know, I would say even some of the places around California where I would drive and all of a sudden I would be on the toll road had no idea. Right, right. They do that a lot without going through any booths or anything. You just see the little sign on the side of the road to pay your toll, text this. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But I think, I think, you know, a listener can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think when I was in Seattle earlier this year and we went up north, part of the highway, if not the entire thing, just all of a sudden was a toll road. And mm -hmm. the way to get around it is you had to exit and go up the, the side streets, which in that way, I think that's an example of being kind of forced to do it. Right. Which right. seems a little crappy. Um Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that similar thing happened to me. I was in Boston, I believe it was, and I hadn't printed out a map quest or something alternate. I'm going back on purpose. Map quest, this guy. I feel That's you. just for comedy. Turn just by turn. <laughs> <laughs> Although they did use to print them for Pat Boone, but anyway. Yeah. Um, so I, I went down, there was like this sort of underground tunnel and I had no idea where I was and I just didn't know for sure. Cause the GPS couldn't work underneath the, the tunnel. And I finally just took a shot at going out someplace. And of course I came out onto some toll road. I was in a rental car and it said something about, you know, I hope you have your, whatever it is, the little badge mm -hmm. you pay for the sticker on the windshield or on the bumper or whatever. And of course I didn't. So I learned how, what that means. I got home, and a week or two later, I got this bill from the rental car company for this huge fine for not paying. So, yeah, that that to me is just not very smart. You know, again, I don't mind paying or knowing about it and choosing it, but being stuck with it after the fact, I didn't care for that. So That's a big one, and that mm -hmm. reminds me, because the, the highway that I was talking about in – Seattle wasn't even the one that you just remind me of years ago. Mm -hmm. When I first started doing my healthcare IT contracting, we had to take a trip from the Seattle area. I think we're in, in written, written Washington West. Mm -hmm. And we had to cross this really big bridge to get to these other cities. And that that's a pay bridge. Like there's no oh, other way. Yeah. You just have to pay to go across the bridge. And yeah. I didn't realize that. And of course you get the ticket, so You have to pay the toll then the whatever administration fee and then whatever convenience fee that the rental car company decides in the contract to charge you. So that could be a very expensive uh, ticket or total right. fine, right. I guess. Yeah, the same thing happened to us in France, I believe. And, you know, there, if you're traveling on a Sunday, they may or may not have a human there to collect something. They mm -hmm. only take certain credit cards, as I recall, and some just don't work. And I don't know about cash. You know, it's just a lot of variables that make traveling harder unnecessarily i think generally could have been worked out differently if they just listened to me <laughs> <laughs> the world would be a better place uh, i got one more for you and we'll get you out of here and i was wrong um this question does appear on here mm. and th this isn't the question i'm going to ask you but that it is on here. Should the government require all new cars to be electric or hybrid by a certain date? I think everyone kind of agree on that. But here's one. Should cities designate special lanes for autonomous vehicles? 
So I don't think you have that there. I know California is pretty big on that. And Phoenix is really big on that um, because we have the Waymo system here, which are Uh cars that essentially drive themselves with a remote operator somewhere monitoring the car. So should there be Hmm. special lanes for autonomous vehicles? Wow. Um, I, I do like easy listening, so to speak, reading about that subject. I'm certainly not an expert at all. Uh, What concerns me is what would concern everybody, at least in the beginning, is just unintended consequences of, you know, the car driving through somebody's house, which I guess some of the Tesla cyber trucks have been doing. Um, Jeez. So I don't know if if a lane in itself would would address that problem. It would seem like a good idea. Uh, And again, it's a it's a, a economy of scale, whatever issue if if there's only one or two self-driving autonomous cars then and you have a whole lane that's reserved only for that that Mm -hmm. wouldn't seem to make too much sense but i think we're just i don't know it's really we're kind of in another you know industrial computer revolution type thing i think it's really going to be interesting to watch i'm glad i'm not the one that has to come up with all the answers uh just elon musk he has to do it so i'll follow him or not (laughs) No, I think that's a that's an excellent response or uh, answer. I, I would I would say, and it does make a lot of sense. Um, when we were in Europe recently, uh, Barcelona, they have, and we may have these in some cities too. I'm thinking maybe New York City, but I don't remember. Uh, but mm-hmm. there were lanes that were only for buses and taxis, and then uh-huh. the rest of the lanes were for the rest of the commuters. So, I mean, but it, obviously when you have buses and a, good, uh, a ton of taxis, then you have the justified traffic. Although yeah. I would argue that maybe it would make more sense if it's a specific time of the day mm-hmm. other than 24 seven, but, and maybe it is. Um, yeah. Yeah. But yeah. So David com, And first off, you know, how often are you confused with the other David Diggs? Um, <laughs> There's an African American David Diggs that's a, also a, a singer. It's David, is yeah, that what it is? Well, David Diggs. He was oh, in Hamilton. Oh, I see. Yeah, he's an actor. Yep. Yeah, when when Hamilton took off, uh, all my YouTube stuff got routed to him, and the search was totally messed up. And yeah, no, he's David. he's in another league for sure. <laughs> um. Yeah, I I got an email a couple of days ago. Somebody went to my website and said, "Oh, I love your what you do." And it was like David, and I said, uh, "That wouldn't be me." So. Oh, that's right, David. Yeah, looks like you were saying, yeah, David Daniel Diggs. Yeah, I've seen this guy before, so that makes sense. Yeah. Still yeah. funny as He's hell. An interesting guy for sure, but it's not me. Yeah. Um, when you were a little offshoot here, but when you were in Barcelona, was there a big, amazing, ornate, round theater that you ran into? I don't, uh, then. I don't recall. Um, maybe because, it, and here's why I said maybe because I know a lot of the bull arenas or whatever they're, whatever they're actually really called, um, mm-hmm. that was outlawed. And so they've turned them into theaters and things. So it could have been one of those. Actually, it was, yeah, it could be, I guess. Well, I think it, you know, it's it's got a roof and everything, of course. But the reason I mention it is the Brecker Brothers, my probably maybe my favorite musical group of all time, uh, did a uh, immortal uh, live concert there, which was at the time a laser disc, and later became other forms of video and an album, and just amazing album project project product. Uh, so I thought maybe you might have walked by it or something and seen that, but anyway, no big deal. Maybe I, I, it's possible. There's there's so many ornate things over there on that side of the world that it's yeah. You were there like three weeks, right, or something? Y- yeah, between that and in uh, in Portugal, which by the way is at this specific time in late July is going through absolute hell. Um, so I guess we got there at the right time. But hmm. you know, there's there's so much beauty on the other side of the world. You know, yeah. and it's just, there's things here that aren't there that I can see someone coming from another country to visit the United States would just have crazy Marvel over. But there's, uh-huh. you know, obviously there's things over there that are just so much older than half the stuff here. And it's that in itself is just amazing. It really is. Yeah. 
centuries or millennia, mm-hmm. yeah, as opposed to just it's a new something being built right here in Eagle down <laughs> right near yeah. the mall. Yeah. Um, one other thing I was just going to mention, mainly for the maybe the NSX listeners, if they find it interesting, uh, the the album my one of my last albums called Jazz Work, which you and I discussed about having a few available at the, the event, maybe um, started as a surround sound DVD audio, mm. and it's a it's something only geeks would even know about but steely dan was one of the very first to implement a dvd audio that's actually the spec or whatever dvd slash a um because it was higher you know, it was 24 bit um uh, probably 48k i believe it had room for high uh, definition videos and interviews and photos and all that really an amazing format and i slipped in on the ground floor my actually a partner of mine was doing all the surround sound mixes of major albums like carol king's tapestry from years before uh foreigner um brain salad surgery by emerson lake and palmer and um just so many classic albums they were dolby hired him to do these surround sound mixes and anyway that album ended up it was called eclectric of mine it ended up on a new label called 5.1 entertainment oh and i i thought i was in on the ground floor of this amazing thing and indeed um the that format was pretty much spearheaded by uh elliot shiner and if you know the name which not everybody's in love with the system but all of the nsx's and tl's and everything from acura use the els sound system mm-hmm. and that that was uh, they actually put selections from my album my dvd surround sound on their sampler for acura for volvo for air force one and two for marantz uh, just a lot of systems so i thought i have arrived i'm on this ground that's floor. awesome it's man wonderful and it sounds great and everything else and guess what nobody cared and they tried the uh the dual disc where they had that on one side and just a stereo on the other and then that's even completely, you know, just went away immediately because people want MP3s they can take to the beach, you know. Sure. So that's the way it goes. But anyway, I just thought it'd be interesting because of the ELS that, you know, pretty much come stock in the NSXs generally and, and have come from Acura for years. So. so you just brought up something and um, it was an unexpected question, but here it is. Have you found mm-hmm. with all these improved technologies or – I wouldn't say approved technologies, but these additional ways to get music out. Is it easier or more difficult than it's ever been, do you think, for musicians? Well, it's definitely more. It's more difficult by far. Um, I don't know if it's because of formats and things, but, I mean, we all read, I'm sure, about how musicians really can't make any money anymore. The streams pay almost nothing. Mm-hmm. And of course, everybody can share it for free, which has been the case for quite a while. That was another one of those, you know, uh oh moments, like when they quit hiring real strings and horns and, and you know, the whole Napster thing when it happened and sharing music, giving it away, seeing, sending it to your friend. It was a real panic. Um, so, but it's out of the bag and that's what we have. So we sell t shirts, I guess, at concerts. That's how we make a living now, I guess. <laughs> Man. Um, but, you know, it, it was a great format. It, the main thing I liked about it, and there's actually a new thing. Um, Pro Tools and other companies are getting behind immersive audio, which is really the same thing. They had quad where you had four speakers in the room before 5.1 or 7.1. And then again, that, that dual disc idea, which was really the same thing. And now they're calling it immersive audio where, you know, fitting all all kinds of music into a stereo mix that's really just the right blend or pull between the left and the right speaker is a chore. You have to use EQ and reverbs the right way and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And you still really can't hear everything you want to hear. Well, with the immersive, immersive, you can put it, you know, kind of to the right, kind of to the left, kind of up on the ceiling, some things down kind of on the floor. I mean, it's just literally a 360 kind of thing. So I hope that does take off. We hear a lot of that still with movies, I guess. I don't really go to movies anymore outside the house, but I think that's that's 
still the promise of what we all wished would happen. And I still hope it does because it's it's quite a format for music, you know. Yeah, I'll be looking out for that technology to increase because for the stuff that you have done, I feel like that type of sound, just like a great movie score, is uh-huh. is best consumed with the highest quality tools that are available. You know, and I'm like millions of people, you know, I used to go to Napster and Audio Galaxy and all those things and LimeWire and et cetera, et cetera, yeah. et cetera. But I used to dabble with mixing music and I stopped doing that because there was just such a variance in quality that you would get. And yeah. when you mix a good quality song with a crappy one, you can tell immediately. Yeah. And yeah. so I just started buying all my music, whether it was three or sometimes $12 for one song, just so I have a quality wave format that I can experiment with. Yeah. And then, you know, you well, see the impact on artists like yourself and then it's like, all right, well now that, because you remember in the, in the eighties and the nineties, when you're buying an album, there might be one hit on there, but you're paying all this money for one song. Right. But now, right. you know, the last 20 years you can just buy a song. And so there's really yeah. no reason to just go and download stuff anymore. Illegally. Yeah. It's good you mentioned that because that is, that is a good reason. And in terms of people who make music, you know, we had to wait might have had three hits that we thought were really great. We need to get them out, but we have to wait until you have 10 songs and right. seven of them might be filler, you know? Mm-hmm. So EPs these days and just five songs, you can throw it on Spotify or Apple music or whatever, and or a single, you know, if you wanted to. So yeah, it's, it's like everything. There's a freedom and it's a more level playing field, but at the same time, there's so much music out there that, I almost wish some of the suits at, you know, Columbia Records or Sony were there more involved at times because they may not have been as musical or I might have disagreed with some of the things they said, but at least they were kind of a filter. You know, you ended up with big, big stars that were clearly talented and had hit songs more than maybe nowadays when everybody can throw it out there. So Right. Well, good deal, man. We could talk for forever. We'll continue this conversation at NS Expo um, for all my, yes. our, all of our NSX listeners. Hopefully, you've enjoyed this episode with David Diggs, and hopefully, you go to NS Expo and you can meet him in person. Otherwise, yes. um, follow him on uh, dis, uh, <laughs> on daviddiggs.com. And where else can we find you? You're also David Diggs just on social media, yeah? Yeah, yeah, definitely Facebook and Instagram mainly, and I'm in the, all the groups, and I'm I'm actually friending every NSX person I can find too, and it's been great to begin to know a few people, and you know, it's a great community. Yeah, definitely is. Glad to be back. <laughs> Sounds good, man. Thanks, David. Thanks, Jay. I really had a good time. Appreciate it. Hard Marking Podcast, a little bit of cars, so much more available anywhere you get your podcast or check it out at hardparkingpod.com.